Good afternoon again. My name is Chelsea. I'm a current graduate student um, and I'm a graduate assistant in the Learning Center and I work with Supplemental Instruction and I'll be going over the PowerPoint that we have a part of our Learning 101 series that focuses on critical thinking. So, the activity we're going to do is called Lost at Sea. So with this, you've decided to quit school and become a sea farm recluse. You pack your things and board a boat traveling the ocean with various destinations, carrying over 200 people. After a day at sea, a fire is starting below the deck and threatens to overtake the boat. There is one lifeboat left and eight people to fit in it. Fit in it when it can only hold five. So, which five will make it to the lifeboat? So, your task in your group is to decide which five are going to make it into the lifeboat. Okay? So, I will give you all two minutes to discuss this. Not including your I'm going to give you two, two minutes to discuss it. So before we go to the next slide. Okay, so <laughs> you don't have to choose any representative or all of you all from your group can talk, but I wanted to know from this group first in the front, which five people did you all choose and why? Oh, uh, we chose a doctor, the scientist, herself. I mean, doctor herself. Yeah. Yourself. Uh, the pregnant woman. Okay. And the elderly woman. And the elderly woman. I would love for you to answer the question. So if you have the discussion, how did you come up with your conclusion? We already kind of discussed like why you chose the people that you chose. But overall, did you have any second guessing when you were trying to decide on a person to choose or how did that go? Yeah, there's a bunch of second guessing. Uh, I made I guess I made my decisions based off how well they could survive in that situation. But the situation was kind of ambiguous. Uh-huh. So you don't know like what type of sea, like how the sea is or where they are, how the boats nearby. So we end up making a lot of assumptions. That's, that's, a, very, that's a very good point. Um and for you all, like did you all have any like conflict on making decisions? Well, in my head I just kind of simplified it to like saying, Well that's your community and that's all you're gonna be living with for the rest of your life. Like which one would you want in said community? Which one would okay. benefit you? Like, it sounds very selfish, but at the same time, like... Yeah, but that's just your perspective of it, though. And, like, the pregnant woman, like, I would pick her because that's a twofer right there. So, <laughs> that mean, that's, that's my thought process. Okay, so what evidence did you all use to support your conclusion? You just stated that the pregnant woman is like a twofer one, so she was bringing in another life in this community. What about you all with your support for your conclusion? I mean, for the I mean, pregnant woman, there's kind of the same reasoning. It's like, oh, someone bringing in another life in. So I was I was thinking more of like, oh, I was kind of, from my end, I was thinking of like, oh, it wouldn't be fair to something that they wouldn't be able to live out their life because of something like this. And then it was also going on a, who could help keep the group together on the other ones. Okay, so what question did you all ask? either ask yourself or ask your group before you came to a conclusion? Or do you feel like it was easier because you all may be on the same page and thinking the same way? Okay, because so what's interesting is that how you stated you were thinking about basically your community and the people you're going to be with for the remainder of this, whereas you were thinking about you know, the ambiguous parts, things that were missing, like, were there going to be more boats, or is there going to be any more help, what type of ocean, where are we? So I like that, it's pretty interesting. Um, so, how was critical thinking needed for this activity? I mean, because you had to think of multiple different, you had to think about multiple different angles, and then you had to put, you had to realize different points of view from the different choices there. And it's a lot of assuming. But you don't actually know the whole story based on each of these characters or each of the people except for yourself. Yeah. Uh, so you definitely just have to like start imagining things like right off the bat. Like we we technically don't know anything about these people, so 
So or we know the doctor could be a killer, but you just didn't put it on there. <laughs> so. True. Or everybody can be a man, and the woman is the only woman there that can reproduce. So mm -hmm. if you were living in your own world, you wouldn't have much reproduction, and everybody would eventually die off. Mm -hmm. Or <coughs> if you were, say for example, if you were in a situation where the Coast Guards would come and help, but there were more boats, it's kind of like you just sacrificed all these people because you're being selfish. Mm -hmm. Different things to consider. Okay, so with that, critical thinking is hard and it takes time to develop, but it's all about your perspective and how much you practice it, which leads to the next point that it takes practice. So with that, what we're learning now is basic skills, but as we matriculate on through college and through life, we're going to always have opportunities to work on our critical thinking skills. Every every day is an opportunity to think about that or to enhance those skills. It's whether or not we decide to do that. Sometimes we get stuck in our own way of thinking that we don't want to think outside of the box or consider other perspectives because you may think this is right or wrong or I believe this because this is what I've been taught. And we become conditioned sometimes. But the good news to that is a skill that everyone that everyone can develop. So um, you can add new skills when you learn. You can share or learn from other people. <clears throat> it depends on what you want to do with it. Everyone is capable of thinking critically. It's whether or not you're going to activate yourself, mentally activate yourself to do so. And also, it's useful for all parts of your life, not just school. So, life in general, things you have to handle outside of school, such as making decisions on which contracts to choose, maybe like for a phone or a bill or something like that. Make a decision on what type of job you want to have, especially if you have so many opportunities in front of you. You have to really think critically about what you want to do or what you're looking for. And sometimes it comes down to you make, making a list and narrowing everything down to the location, the weather, the pay, the benefits you may get, the skills they're looking for, the type of environment they may have, which that brings you to your interview or if you interview them. So those are things you want to consider. So with that, Thinking is an adjective, um, rational and reasoning. People are thinking like animals. So that's how they use that. That's an example of how they use that as an adjective. Um, also thoughtful and reflective. Uh, use as a noun, thought, judgment, reflection, which can be labeled as clear thinking. But critical thinking, so critical thinking is completely different from thinking. With critical thinking is a noun, Discipline thinking that is clear, rational, open-minded, and informed by evidence. That's the most important part. It's informed by evidence. Sometimes we think about things or we come to certain assumptions and we only find things to confirm those assumptions, but we don't acknowledge things that deny those assumptions. And that's kind of where most of us trip up. We only focus on things that confirm what we believe rather than things that don't confirm what we believe. Okay, so we have different types of thinking. So of course, uh, ritual thinking, things that we do without being aware, such as maybe getting up and going to get in the shower, even though we think about that because we get tired sometimes, you don't want to wake up, but you have to do it. Um, so things like taking a shower or maybe um, getting dressed, eating, chewing your food. Like you don't think, you don't have to tell yourself to chew your food, like it's kind of like an automatic response, your body's response, and it does it on its own. You don't have to tell your heart to beat, it does it on its own. Um, and of course, like driving, or if you're driving home, you sometimes you zone out in the music, but you know, like, I'm trying to get home, so I want to take the normal route that I always take. You don't have to really focus on it, because it's just so habitual that you've done it so many times before. Okay, random uh, thinking, daydreaming, or spontaneous thoughts, or these random thoughts can also, uh, random thinking can also come up. You may see something that may trigger a response. Like for example, if you're on Twitter and you see someone tweet something and then you go into this whole rabbit hole of thinking about other things or if you go into, it's like, it's like YouTube. You go in there for one thing and then you end up spending hours watching a million other videos unrelated to what you went on there for. That's kind of the process <coughs> of random thinking. And appreciative thinking. It's the awareness that we like something. So people do argue that appreciative thinking is um, 
counterproductive to critical thinking because it's kind of like you're in a phase where you admire things for what they are. For example, you admire nature, but you don't really need much to explain your feelings towards that or your thoughts or your beliefs towards that, although we do have science. But even then, who's to say that's exactly true? Okay, and then we have the critical thinking. So of course, that's uh, making judgments, and that is to say that the application of reason has to have a set of facts. So, with that, who can define reason for me? In the best way that you can, how would you define it? Uh, purpose of an action. Purpose of an action? Okay, anyone else? Reasoning is the ability to be able to make inductive and deductive uh, analysis of situations that best fit the given situation. Okay. Anyone else? You don't want to take a stab at it? Okay. That's fine. That's fine. So, with that, um, reason is a use of supposed truths as evidence in support of other supposed truths. So, in essence, what you stated. Um, but keep in mind, sometimes our reasoning is based on, well, sometimes we base our assumptions on our reasoning. So with that, we have this supposed truth, which is this assumption. Let's say we think, let's say we think that all white horses are unicorns. So that's your supposed truth. And then, you essentially have evidence to back that up, whatever evidence that you may think. Do I think they're unicorns? I'm not sure. I've never been that close to them. But some people have different reasons as to why they can back that up if they were, you know, providing that as a true statement. Rather than actually looking for anything that denies that. So that's how we get caught up in our assumptions and find the truth in our assumptions rather than finding something that may lead us to believe something different. Okay, so when examining, um, okay, okay, click on everything. Okay, so when examining your critical thinking, of course you want to clarify your thinking. So you want to pin down thinking and give a specific meaning to it. Why you're doing it, how you're going to do it, and when you're going to do it. Some things you don't have to because we have so many different types of thinking where we sometimes daydream or we sometimes do things that are habitual and we don't know that we're doing them. Um, but also, if you cannot completely summarize what someone has said in your own words, you don't understand what they said. So essentially, if I'm here talking and you can't grasp the concept of what I'm stating, or if you can't put it in your own words, then that means that you're not fully following or keeping up. Because it's easy, it's normal when you hear things from someone and people hate this, but then they'll say, so what you're saying is X, Y, and Z. Because they're trying to communicate in the way that they understand it. So if you can't communicate something in a way which you can understand, then that means that you're not fully grasping the concept of whatever you're learning. Um, so you definitely want to always clarify your thinking by trying to put things into your own understanding and making sure it's the same thing that's being communicated. Also, stick to the point. So with fragmented thinking, that's thinking that laps with no logical connection. We've seen it. I don't want to call up the obvious example of it that we see on TV so often lately, but um, it's thinking at least with no logical connection. So for example, a particular person may say, well, we don't like this type of person because of X, Y, and Z, and then someone else will agree with them, but they have no reason why they agree. They can't support it. They don't have any facts behind it or any truths behind it as to why they believe it. They just believe it because someone else is stating it. So there's no logic behind it. And maybe the person stating it has no logic behind it. It's just kind of something that they assume. So also, discipline thinking. Thinking intervenes when thoughts wander from what is uh, pertinent. So just staying focused, trying to stay on task, it's easy for us to go off into the ambiguity of things rather than creating something and sticking to it. So with the question, with the activity with Lost at Sea, you all, you, all, you, know, you all made the point, well, we don't know if there were any boats around. We don't know where we were. We kind of want to pick one point or pick one side of it 
and assume that with this scenario, this is what's going to happen, rather than leaving room for ambiguity. Because if you leave room for ambiguity, then what happens? Nothing ever gets solved. Okay. So of course, you have to always question. So be on the lookout for questions, um, both the ones we ask and the ones that we fail to ask. So with that, though it's okay to think about things that weren't considered or things that weren't mentioned, we still want to pick a path and go along that path, but still consider those things. So we want to stick to the, we want to consider it, but we don't want to like drift off and lose focus of what we're focusing on. Also, learn to ask questions that lead to de deeper thinking. For example, um, with the uh, lost at sea, you all said that the pregnant woman was going to be like a twofer. But did we ever consider well, what happens if the baby doesn't isn't actually born, or what happens if she's already lost the baby, or who's going to say who's to say that this child, like you said, who's to say that this um, doctor isn't a, ki a killer? Like we kind of didn't focus on those things, we just decided to get them for various reasons. Also, be reasonable. One hallmark of critical thinking, of a critical thinker, is the disposition to change one's mind when given good reason to change. So, that's like the thing with the unicorns, even though we know like that's kind of like silly, and that's fine, but it's just an example for now. With the thing with the unicorns, you may spend most of your time trying to prove why you think they're real, until someone comes along and makes you change your mind because they gave you good reason to believe that it isn't. So we always want to consider those different points of different things, different factors in our supposed truth that we have. Okay, and have you all taken uh, any logic classes here? You were going to raise your hand. Was it a class similar? And not here. Not here? But you've taken one before? Yes. Okay, so you understand like, the premises and fallacies. <coughs> I'm not sure if you all take that here or how they have your course versus it set up. They do have elements of it in the, the communications class, like argumentation inquiry. They yeah, yeah, yeah. Fallacies there. Exactly. So I think it's a class that most of us are going to take in undergrad or something similar. So with that, um, of course, the fallacy is a wrong belief, a false or mistaken idea. With that, um, you, mis you do the mistake of using your reason as a factual thing. So, the types of fallacies we have, hasty generalizations, and I want to call on you all to give me examples. So for hasty, generali gener oh, excuse me, hasty generalizations, you draw conclusions from inadequate evidence. So could you give me an example of that? What's your name? Me? Yes. Oh, James. Uh, let's say, since there's one Canadian driver, you know, you know, swerving in lanes, that means that all Canadian drivers swerve in between lanes. It's a hasty generalization. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, circular reasoning, offering proof using another version of the argument. That's a complicated one. Anybody want to take a stab at that? Does Chris want to take a stab at that? <laughs> like I know I've heard um, I know I've like listened to circular reasoning, but I'm trying to remember an exact example to give. Um, Let's think about our Democratic Party. I was gonna say that. Oh, our political parties. Um, like if you could pick a candidate, or whatever, whichever candidate, which candidate best applies to these different examples? That's if you pay attention to what they're saying and how they make their arguments. It doesn't matter who you're going for. That's, you know, your personal thing. Well, oh, one circular reason I couldn't, I thought of a specific example. It was a video I saw of uh, Marco Rubio, and he was talking to, he was talking to a man who, a gay man who was questioning like, why are you trying to keep me from getting married? And then Marco Rubio was like, oh, well, I'm just trying to keep think, I'm trying to keep it, like, I'm just trying to keep my definition of marriage. In there, and he's like, "Why doesn't mine acceptable?" And then Marco said, "Oh, well, you have to go by the laws." And then the guy said, "Well, uh, the law is that's legal, and now you're trying to change it." And Marco Rubio kept just going back and forth between, a, "Oh, I'm trying to change it," or "If you don't like it, change the law." But it was like a very circular thing. Makes sense. Makes sense. Okay, so argument to the person, attacking the person <laughs> rather than the argument. I think we say that a lot. 
already. So can anybody give an example of that? Trump. Trump does attack people. He does. I he mean, does. we can't we can't attack his argument too, but most of the uh, most of people just attack the person when they don't even listen to him or to what he's saying. His proposals. True. This is very true. What about the either or fallacy, offering only two alternatives when more exist? <laughs> Did you think of an example? Uh. The two parties running. Well, oh. there's more. <laughs> this is that's true. That is a really it's good one. Yes. Yeah. Wow. That, yeah. I would have thought that. <laughs> what about red herring? Trying to distract attention away from an issue by introducing a new issue. I have an example, but I would like to hear from you all. You yeah. know, that that just sounds like lying in general. <laughs> Most liars have a tendency to redirect, uh, True. redirect everything, like upon being caught in a lie. So this is like an, a good example of what I've seen. You all have heard about the Flint, Michigan water crisis. <coughs> okay, the same week that that was like really coming out in Ohio, they passed the law banning anal sex, <laughs> and it was kind of like people are dying. <laughs> <laughs> and getting lead poisoning, like children and people are losing, having uh, miscarriages, and then you're. No, no. I can see you say rape, but you're saying sex. Like, <sighs> yeah. They use this a lot in the media. Well, in Mexico, when they want to cover up uh, some political issue attacking the society or something, they just come up with another very minor issue. Yeah, and blow and it up. People just buy. <laughs> yeah, like like so. hotcakes. Um, what about jumping the bandwagon? Saying something that is right or permissible because everyone does it. No examples. Can I hear from either two of you in the back? Either one of you. Okay. Uh. And now we're like using the juices of our brains. Um, like um, that woman that turned away a gay couple, and then everyone else Kim Davis. did the same because she did it. That way. Yeah, I remember her. She was. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, or that's like you know when you did something wrong with your parents. It's like, well, if your friends jump off a bridge, are you going to do it? That was like the worst thing to hear from your parents because at that point you knew you messed up. And you knew that you're, you were smarter than that, but somehow, because everyone did it, you thought that it was okay to do it too. Okay, so with that, we have to have a growth mindset. So in a fixed mindset, students believe that their basic abilities, their intelligence, their talents, are just fixed traits. They have a certain amount of, oh, a certain amount, and that's that. In a growth mindset, though, Students understand that their talents and abilities can be developed through effort, good teaching, and persistence. So how many of you are reconsidering what you have to offer after hearing that? It's kind of like, okay, well maybe this is all I have to offer, when in reality, you can build upon that and make it more, or strengthen it and grow it. So with that, So with that, um, we get into the science of learning. I want to make sure I'm on the, okay, there we go. So we get into the science of learning. So education is not the learning of facts, but the training of the mind to think. You want to tell that to people now, please? <laughs> That's a very yeah. good point. You made a very good point. So um, with this uh, model, was larger on this screen that you're looking at. Um, with this model, it's showing the different stages that the uh, neurons connect in the human brain. So the neurons in the brain constantly make new connections and refining the current ones. The brain is a mutable organ capable of reorganizing itself and readapting to new kinds of sensory input and phenomena <coughs> as neuroplastic. So with that, just biologically, we're constantly, our neur neurons are constantly 
reconnecting and doing new things and making new connections. So, with that, and I like the statement that you made, unfortunately, some people get to college and then we regurgitate what we learn, and we never fully learn it for what it is, what it is. when in reality, it's good to know your skill and your trade or whatever degree field you're in, but imagine how much you can change that field by thinking outside of the box that they're putting you in. And just thinking about, and with that, you do that with your critical thinking, training your mind to think. But why have we always done these formulas this way? Why have we always participated in this type of thing rather than doing something new? Um, with that, I wanted to mention Bloom's taxonomy. Have you all heard of that before? What? Bloom's taxonomy. Okay, well, Bloom's taxonomy was a, it was made in the 1960s and it's made for uh, developing learning outcomes for students. So with that, they have different levels that students would master or would have to master to reach a learning outcome. So say if your learning outcome, and a lot of people still use it today, say if your learning outcome was possibly solving a math equation. Well, no, well, let's say doing a scientific equation. So by doing a scientific equation, you have to understand what your different uh, chemicals are doing in that equation and how to avoid something from blowing up or understand the chemical re reactions that may happen before you actually start doing it. Because if not, then you face the uh, potential of messing something up. So so many steps you have to have, mm -hmm. so many steps you have to reach and have before you actually get to that point of actually executing that thing. So with that, the first thing they have is remembering. And a lot of us are still at that remembering stage. We learn a lot of things and we remember it to regurgitate it onto a test, but have we fully acquired that knowledge and know how to apply it and do other things with it. So with remembering, um, you make an observation and you recall information. You also, uh, when someone asks you to tell, describe, quote, define, you can put that information down. But that's just the basis of it. It's just that you remember it. Kind of like, you know what a noun is. A noun is a person, place, or thing. Then we kind of limit our thinking right there and we leave it there. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to properly use that part of speech correctly. Also, the next thing is um, understanding information. Now, we know that we have students who are like still at this remembering phase, even though we're all over 18. Some of us are still at that remembering phase where we just regurgitate information. So when we get these degrees and we get into the workforce, it's kind of like, oh, what have I been doing? I don't, I'm not sure if I was as prepared as I should have been. Because it's still that remembering phase. But the next phase would be the understanding phase. So with that, you can make a summary, you can describe it, you can teach it to someone else. Um, you can also grasp the, grasp the meaning or the reasoning behind why you do a certain thing or how it's supposed to be done. Now, a lot of us reluctantly make it to that understanding part when we get these degrees and we understand the purpose of this profession or this job or whatever you're contributing from, to society. Um, now, the third step is applying it, and that's when it matters, of course. So, what are you all's majors here? Development. Oh, yay, good. Okay, so <laughs> I don't even have to ask you any questions. Anyone else? Psychology. Psycho good, good. Okay, and what's? Engineering. Oh, yes, you need applying skills. And you? Decision sciences. Wow, okay, great. So with all of this, all of those uh, different disciplines that you all are under, you need to understand the aspect of applying your knowledge that you have. How to get a certain result, how to get a certain outcome out of what you're doing. So with applying, you understand the methods that you have to do, use and how to use them. You understand the concepts and the different theories behind why you operate the way you do or why someone else may operate the way that they do. Um, you also can solve the problems without any assistance because you've already remembered and you understand and now you know how to apply it to fix it. Um, also, analyzing. All right, I'm, I'm a really, really big Twitter person. So a lot of people, i found that they're not very analytical. We kind of take things as face value. So with being analytical, you see the patterns. You see the different traits. You see when something is off or something is different. Um, you also recognize hidden meaning. So you can separate things or you can connect meanings or you can um, analyze why they're different. And 
also we have evaluating. So with evaluating, of course you have different compare and contrast to see will this be the best decision or is this how I should have done this? Am I applying this the right way? And evaluating is almost like your hypothesis. You go through the check, you go through this whole procedure, your hypothesis, you go through a conclusion to see if it was right, if it isn't right, you go back and you reevaluate because you didn't get the outcome that you wanted. So with that, you access a, uh, you assess a value of theories, you make choices based on different arguments, and you recognize subjectivity. And that's what you did when you talked about the ambiguity of the plot that we did in the beginning. That's recognizing the subjectivity because there were a lot of things that were left up for discussion that weren't fully explained or said. Um, and finally, create. That's what we need in our new leaders today. So when you ask, can we tell our students this and they're going to believe it? We need people who are going to be creators. People who can use old ideas and create new ones, who can relate knowledge from several different areas and create something different, and consider outside perspectives or different perspectives, and also predict and draw conclusions. So with that, that comes uh, along with creating, inventing, substituting, possibly changing a formula that we may know. Okay, so with the fixed mindset, and I really wish we had like classes that did this for our students. You know, like across the United States, that'd be great. But with the fixed mindset, intelligence is static, whereas with the growth mindset, intelligence can be developed. Some people, you know, for example, they may write off children who have learning disabilities, and then they'll struggle for the rest of their lives because people already have this stigma against them because of this, the disability that they have, rather than realizing that we can develop these children to be on the same level playing field as another child of the same age or um, grade level. So, with the fixed mindset, it leads to a desire to look smart, therefore a tendency to avoid the challenges, give up easily due to obstacles, see effort is fruitless, ignore useful, useful feedback, and be threatened by other people's success. So, the key word is to look smart. Meaning they don't possess those different traits of Bloom's taxonomy that we mentioned. They may just be at the remembering stage, but they're not analyzing, they're not evaluating, they're not creating. So with the uh, growth mindset, it leads to a desire to learn, and therefore, you have a tendency to embrace challenges, persist despite obstacles, see effort as a path to mastery, learn from criticism, and be inspired by other success. So especially in the STEM field, those are the type of people they're looking for. They're looking for people who want to take on new challenges and solve new things. And any, honestly, anything with science, even with children. We want to understand their behaviors. We want to make them better. We want to make them smarter. So you have to have that growth mindset to want to take on the challenges and desire to learn more and become more so you can give more to that discipline. So how many people have, like, who people, what, which one of you all believe that you may have like poor reading skills? And not poor because you don't <coughs> know how, but like, poor because you don't want to. Poor what? Reading skills. Like you get assigned so much work. I hate reading. Oh. But me, I would read something cover to cover before I go and ask a question. Because you know you want to be sure. But when you get work, it's like, why am I reading all this? It's not necessary. But yeah. So critical readers, um, they preview the text, look up unknown words, they slow down, and they annotate the text. Some people will read a passage, and they may not understand certain words, but they won't go to find those definitions of the words. Whereas a person who's a critical thinking or a critical reader may read it, find out the definitions, and those definitions bring more context and understanding to what they read. So we definitely want to be critical readers. So with that, we want to underline important information and key ideas. Um, define words that you don't know, that's always, because that brings everything into perspective. And make notes and expand on what's offered in the reading. And ask questions as you read. So even if you can't come to the conclusion yourself, you still have a classmate or a professor that you can ask that in class. How many of y'all have said in the lecture hall when no one has had a question for the professor? How many of you all think that they applied the same type of method to critical reading? Exactly. So we have to definitely consider those things 
we kind of make it harder for our professors when we don't do anything critical or critical reading or critical thinking because it's kind of like, okay, did you actually read this? Because you should have the questions. Because it's kind of like their expectation. That's their learning outcome. If you read, if you're where you're supposed to be, or you've already been able to analyze and create and evaluate, then when you come to class, you will have questions about the reading. Okay, so critical writing. So summary versus synthesis. So with the summary, and a lot of us tend to do summary and not synthesize. Extracting the main idea or central point and rewording the information in a sentence or two. That's literally like what the summary is. So a lot of us, we just summarize things and kind of change it around rather than synthesizing the information. And with synthesizing, you weave together information from several sources, including your own prior knowledge. But we don't do that. And we're not asked to do that either. So that's the, another thing to consider. So summary restates, synthesis compares and contrasts. The summary maintains the distinction between each individual source, and the synthesis makes a combination to have a useful statement. Summary pulls information to highlight an important part, or as the synthesis highlight important points, plus it allows you to draw and support any conclusion you may come up with. Summary shows what the original article wrote, whereas synthesis understands what they wrote, how it relates to other pieces of information, and they gain new insights from it. And the summary provides a single perspective on a problem or issue, whereas the synthesis allows you to gain an understanding that has been done on an issue and also the gaps in the research. Okay, so of course, these are ways to be, uh, to be critical thinkers or be a critical class participant because it's easy to be distracted by someone typing on their um, computer or to be in your cell phone or you're just like daydreaming. Like, I still daydream sometimes. Like often, actually. But this is how we can avoid this. <coughs> I can listen for who, what, when, where, why, how. What do we call those words? If you've ever, I'm an English major, so I have a different view of it. Uh, I feel like you're, like you're close to it. I see it on your face. Yeah. It's like I remember, but I don't remember. Uh, they call it the uh, journalist question. Yeah, yeah. Because they always want to know who, what, when, where, how, how many, to what extent, what day, what time, how was it, when did you do it. They want to give you all the information. So with that, you actively listen for those things and you connect the current lecture back to the reading or the past lectures and life experiences. It also includes um, PowerPoints too that you may have. You always connect every, the class discussion, the professor gives you a reading or they may give you a um, PowerPoint to review so when they get a class and a lecture, you all are on the same page and you know the same information but you're kind of bouncing off ideas because you have those synthesizers who have made comparisons and who have found gaps or who want to learn something more or have challenged what they've already read. Also, ask questions that dive deeper into the material. Sometimes we sit in the classroom and they'll ask, oh, well, do you have any more questions? And it's kind of like one versus 100, but the 100 don't have any, any questions to ask. They don't, have, they don't want to go any further. They may not be able to go further because we haven't developed those skills yet. So with that, you want to synthesize the material across many courses, draw conclusions, and make emphasis. Also, evaluate the course material based on all of your knowledge. So a great thing to do is to also always go back on your prior knowledge. Even though, for example, you may be an engineer, you may have some type of prior knowledge that made you interested in this subject at first. And you may have seen different things compared to what you're learning now. So it's always great to ask questions to get an understanding. Critical thinking in the real world. And what's the first point? In voting. <laughs> so, critical thinking in the real world. When voting, a lot of times uh, I've seen, you see like different videos on Facebook or Instagram and Twitter, people making different claims, accusations, talking about the candidates. But in reality, for example, and I'll just use myself, when I'm thinking about who to vote for, I'm thinking about how is it going to affect me and the economic aspect, the job aspect, 
um, the criminal justice system, or the like how voting for this person would adversely change the rest of my life, rather than, oh, I'm going to vote for them because I agree with everything they're saying. You may agree, but how does it affect you? How does it affect your family or the people around you? So that's one thing to consider. We're making decisions about life. Let's say getting married or being pregnant, getting, to, you know, building a family. We want to consider how this is going to change my income. How is it going to change my work life? Um, what does this mean for our living situation? What does this mean for gas and money? You know, once you have kids, you'll be making the same amount of money either way if you have a child or not. But you're going to have new expenses and new things to do, and you're going to have to shuffle your time around differently. So, you know, unfortunately, some people don't consider those things. Also, critical thinking in every single job you will ever have. So you all are in some really nice professions, from what I've heard. And we always want to consider how things are going to affect us, how we're going to affect other people, how can we bring about change. Is what we're doing, is what always been done, or can we do something different to make it better? Um, and problem solving, of course. And when talking with trusted professionals. So we're talking with trusted professionals, that's just whether or not you're going to accept their recommendations or if you're going to like just avoid them altogether. Or do you have a relationship where you can trust what they're saying to you is helpful? Or is someone really just misleading you or just fluffing the information that they're telling you? So, on here. The Critical Thinking video series from Procon.org. Critical Thinking Explained. What is critical thinking? And how does it lead to greater citizen involvement? We think critically every single day, without even thinking about it. When we buy a tomato, does it look ripe? Does it have any blemishes? Was it grown locally? Is it organic? Is organic food better for me? Or when we decide which movie to see? Who directed it? Who are the actors? Is it in 3D? What do my friends say? Do my friends' opinions matter to me? But when it comes to the most important and controversial issues in our society, such as healthcare, illegal immigration, the death penalty, climate change, whom to vote for, and many others, we often find it too difficult or time-consuming to really think critically about them. And that's a big problem for all of us. We face a constant barrage of inaccurate, misleading, and biased news and information, which prevents many people from thinking critically and making informed decisions. A critical thinker can begin to clear away the confusion simply by questioning statements and assumptions. Who said that? Is that source reliable? Do you have data supporting that claim? Has that been scientifically proven? Are you qualified to speak on this topic? And do you have a personal stake in the issue? Discussions and debates can promote critical thinking, and that produces more involved citizens. Research has shown that students who regularly take part in class discussions are more likely to vote in later life, follow political news, be interested in the political process, and have confidence in their ability to influence public policy. A survey of more than a thousand people aged 15 to 25 found that young people who debated issues in class were more likely to sign a written petition, walk, run or ride for charity, and attend a community meeting. Critical thinking it helps to clear away confusion, encourages citizen involvement, and leads to a stronger democracy. Procon.org shows you topics from every angle, so you can think critically about the issues and make informed decisions about where you stand. www.procon.org Promoting critical thinking, education, and informed citizenship. Made with generous support from the Herb Block Foundation. law on the concealed carry. So, though we're at the end of it, I want to hear y'all's opinions about that. If you Do y'all read the campus emails that they send out mm -hmm. and things like that? Or Every now and then. Every now and then. So are you aware of the yeah. campus concealed carry? Yep, but you can't, I think you have to have a concealed handgun license to carry on campus. That one carry is not effective. Yeah, I thought yeah. not being able to carry here. Yeah, it doesn't start until August. I think they said August. But they're also kind of being known about it because they're, 
Like, I'm glad you went there because I want to see how critically do you think that they thought about that policy. Well, in my thought process, is they're putting up, they put money away for a budget to add lockers to each of our buildings so that we can conceal our guns or, or weapons, whatever, in there, uh, in each of these like lockers. Because I attended one of the one of the policy meetings that they had. Yeah. And so it's technically you're not even carrying the weapon with your with you at that time. It's being placed in these quote unquote safety lockers, and then even that we still have our like rights to keep it in our property, which is like our cars or some of us who are staying in apartments with specific like regulations that go along with it. So I don't know, it's, to me that was silly, that we're passing this <coughs> law at a very liberal school. Mm -hmm. With- it's, the, it's in the state, actually. It's the yes, state it's the state, state, but I'm talking like specifically so, yeah, in Dennis. Um, so the whole state has the right to. Uh, but we put money in our budget to where we actually would use that money for something else. I don't know, I get into it when it comes to that. Yeah. When it comes to our education, that's where I get a little iffy. Yeah. Is that we put a whole, we put a good chunk of money into these lockers. Do you know, or did you know, a lot of people who make these decisions aren't even in the education field. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, you have to consider like, okay, well, they, they aren't even thinking in our lens. Mm -hmm. They don't understand what we go through or how we have to deal with certain things with students or classmates and things like that. But yet, what makes them qualified? And the question, the answer to that question is money. A lot of these people have the money to be in these positions, to be board of trustee members or to be state legislators and things like that. And they may not be qualified for that. It's kind of like how you have some college presidents who don't have educational degrees. They just have degrees like in business and other things. And while money is an important factor for college, what's most important is the type of students you're graduating and the rate in which you're graduating them. Mm -hmm. So that's something to consider. Um, and I, I like how they brought up the different things as far as the political aspects. So he mentioned, well, the, cloud, the bubbles they had. They talked about gay mayors. They talked about gun laws and they talked about marriage laws and the criminal justice system. All things that I believe a lot of people haven't considered when they go out to vote because our democratic debates or political debates haven't, they haven't had active discussions about this stuff. They've kind of been doing all those different ways of fallacy and presenting false information and attacking each other. So it's just something good to consider. But before we finish, I want to let you all know about the uh, services we have at the Learning Center. On the top left of the, yeah, top left of the pie chart, we do have tutoring services. We have volunteer tutoring. All of our tutors meet in the Willis Library whenever you are available to meet them. You have to go online to schedule that. Also, online tutoring, you can do that from your home, and we do that on a platform called Upswing. So if you log onto our website, you can still download that platform, and you can do that wherever you are. And supplemental instruction, uh, we have students who sit in the classroom with the students who have already passed that class. Um, and they review, they host review focus groups for that class three days a week. With support services, we have academic coaching. We also have learning one-on-one -on -one series, which is what this is. We teach time management, study skills, note-taking, test-taking, speed reading, a plethora of things. We also have semester reboot, where it includes all of those learning one-on-ones, but you attend this session once a week for five weeks. Also, the other service we have, we have the information for TSI students who want to become TSI complete or who need uh, remediation. We also have graduate school prep and grad school resources. So a lot of things you don't have to buy or you may not have to pay full price for it. We can help you get those resources. So that's all. Any questions? No? Okay. Well, thank you all for participating.